Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm your host, Brian Broom, and I'm joined this time by Emily Maxson and Greg Ottinger. Today, we'll be continuing the discussion from last episode, or continuing the story from last episode of, uh, of Naaman. And I mean, it's really kind of a straightforward concept for this episode. There is only one way. So, Greg. Why don't you uh, start us off, give us the context again, and lead us into this. Well, last time we saw that there is this Syrian general named Naaman, so powerful, valiant, intelligent warrior, but he's a leper. And somewhere along the line, his men had brought captive from northern Israel a little girl, a maid, she's called, we don't know her name. Her village had probably been sacked and burnt, and her family was probably dead. So she has been taken prisoner and made to serve with them, the bad guys, the other side, the aliens, the invaders, the monsters. And we talked about this last time, and this, the sweet temperament uh, and kind spirit that God gave this little girl, in that she says out loud, oh, would the, to God that my Lord Naaman was with the prophet that's in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, we saw last time that God rarely healed people of leprosy, and he had never done it through a prophet. And in fact, our Lord, during his ministry, said there were many lepers in Israel, and none of them were healed by Elisha, except this man. So, the little girl was unusual in her faith and her scope for for love and uh, her understanding of the grace of God. But anyway, what she says leaks out, and eventually it makes its way to the king, and the king says, well, that this would enhance my guy and me, so if this is what it takes, we'll do this. And he sends Naaman with a train of um, pack animals with gold and treasures and stuff down to the king of Israel, because in those days, if there was a prophet, he would be working for the king. Uh, and the Naaman comes with a letter that says, here's my servant uh, Naaman, heal him of his leprosy, and here's stuff for you. <laughs> And the king of Israel said, tears his clothes and says, am I God to kill and to make alive? He's obviously pro- trying to provoke a quarrel. Now, this was not unheard of. There's a story of the, uh, I believe it was the Assyrian king, but someplace in, some king someplace in Sumer or in the, the Mesopotamia, sent a letter to the Egyptian pharaoh saying, your royal hippopotamus in the Nile is is snoring so loud at night that I can't sleep. Do something about it or it means war. Well, <laughs> far-fetched claims were not unknown. And so the king of Israel assumed, this is ridiculous. How can, how can I heal this guy? Obviously, this is just a step toward war. But Elisha, and now we, we have, we've moved past Elijah to Elisha, his protege and replacement, uh, Elisha sends a note to the king, and it's amazing how much Elisha is in the background. He sends a note that says, um, wh- why have you rent your clothes? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. So, Naaman is given, presumably, Google Maps or something, and goes off with his whole <laughs> his chariots and his horses and pack animals, and comes before this little house. It's probably a hovel, and pastors probably were not paid any better than they are now. Uh, and um, stops there, and Elisha again sends out a messenger. We find later his name is Gehazi, and the message he sends is very simple. Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And that's it. Well, Naaman is a citizen of Syria, pagan land, and he knows how religion is supposed to work. He knows what a good magic show looks like. You know, there, there's ceremony, and there's pomp, and there's trances, and there's a lot of screaming and yelling, and there's calling on the gods, and that's that's how this is done, especially in the case of someone as important as he is, and he just tells me to go wash in this muddy river, and Naaman throws a little tizzy fit, um, and he is wroth. And he went away and said, behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and Stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. This is too simple, too vulgar, too common, too easy. Give me something hard to do, 
have me climb the highest mountain, swim the deepest ocean, pass the dragons of eternity to come to the caves of forever and <laughs> solve the seven riddles. You know, it's something that's worthy of my stature as a general, something to stroke the flesh. And I would do that, but simply submit to a bath in this muddy river. Who does he think I am? Does he not know with whom he reckons? Well, he's got one thing about Naaman. He employs cool people around him, like a little girl. And some of his <laughs> some of his servants come to him later <clears throat> and say, "Father." It's interesting they call him father. They have that kind of relationship with him. My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith, "Wash." and be clean. And you can hear the echo of the gospel in their words. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Wash mm. and be clean. This reminds me too of actually something you said at our school graduation last night, which reminded me of something my mom said years ago <laughs> when I was going through a very difficult time where she said, um, you can't always try your best. Mm. <laughs> you, yeah. you just can't. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to try your best and to do it for everything. You can't do it. No. For me, the temptation is always, well, I I need to do my best at this thing, so I'm going to put it off until I have time to do my best, <laughs> <laughs> and then it never gets done, because obviously what I would do right now would not be good enough, and so yes. I shouldn't, um, because, you know my best is clearly worth waiting for. <laughs> it's like, that's the, I, that's the I, arrogance I, behind it. I've had a few students like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one I, of them I, was me. <laughs> yeah, true. I, uh, I love something you said once before, and I hope this does not embarrass you. Well, I don't care that much, actually, because I'm going to say it. <laughs> but uh, you, you said once, I know that this thing is not required. This is not required. However, hey, it's me. So I need to do better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that is the arrogance that dwells in my heart. <laughs> yep. And that's a story that's going to be told until I uh, retire probably because it is not characteristic of you alone. I've had a great many students and I have some right now who are, you know, I've got to do better. I have to do my best. I have to, I have to get every point on the test and every bonus point. And if I'm not, then I, I had mm -hmm. a young lady come to me the other day and say, I... This, these things were not on the study sheet that you gave me. My first thought was, so what? But I didn't say that. And then <laughs> I, then I, but I did say, I just reviewed these with the class at the beginning of, with, with everybody at the beginning of class, because I was afraid that might be so. But I was in another teacher's room talking to her, and she's nearly, she's shaking almost, and almost going into tears, and I said, look, does it matter that much to you? Is it that important? And she had to think about it. It didn't take her long, but she had to think about it. Mm -hmm. And she was, she was, it was hard for her. It was really hard to admit, no, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, and when she did admit it, I said, I'm oh, fine. I'll just mark them. This, these don't count against you. Just to be nice to her, not prolong the stress too long. But I see this a good deal. Now, of course, there's the other side of, Hey, none of this really matters in light of eternity. Why should I even try? No, that's the wrong lesson too. <laughs> so last night- God gave and, this to you to do. It yeah, does matter you, yeah. in eternity. It does matter. It does matter in eternity. So you do need to do it, but trying to do your best, whatever in the world that means, sacrifice all their time commitments and loyalties and chores and responsibilities. So this one thing can be perfect. Mm. No, that's ridiculous. Only God is perfect. There was a, a thing like that I found this week and I showed it to uh, Emily, my wife, and it was like what people think showing up every day means. And it's like, you know, nine circles and they're all filled to the brim, each one of them. It's like what it actually looks like is, you know, there's the first one's filled. The second one's like half filled. There's, a, there's one that was like a third filled, 75%, another one that's 100% filled. And it's like all of this is like your representing your effort on a given day, your energy that you have to put into mm -hmm. it. And it's like, it matters more that you actually show up and do something on the day than it does that it's a hundred percent of your energy in that particular yeah. thing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here we have, bringing us back to the text, we have a man who was used to doing his best. 
and always surviving and always winning and always being the center of attention and never making a mistake. And so when he's asked to do something, he expects that he has to do something hard, not something anybody could do. That's for the common rabble. I'm special. I have to be challenged with something very difficult. I mean, we're talking about now. It, it's leprosy was not what we know as leprosy. It was some kind of skin disease. It probably didn't hurt that much. It probably just uncomfortable. Mostly, it was socially unacceptable, but it was something obviously that was getting in the way of his career and his place in in the palace. And the king wanted it taken care of. But it wasn't that huge a thing. But it was huge enough that it, that it needed to be dealt with. But he wants to deal with it on his terms, and he is frankly insulted. First of all, he's being sent to. The, the, the irony here, we saw the little girl get sent to them. Now, one of them has to come back to her people and mm -hmm. ask a favor. And they start at the top with the king and all kinds of treasures. And now they're down to pulling up be beside some hovel and not even talking to the prophet, talking to a servant, uh, a, a young man, a seminary student, just comes out and says, um, here's the what you have to do. Bye. This is this is beyond this guy's level. He's been humiliated into going to the other side and asking a favor with, well, asking for something to be done that he's going to pay for, and then finding out it's not what he thought and there's no payment involved. How many people come to the gates of the kingdom of God offering their filthy rags of righteousness and being incensed when they're told, oh, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs? You've never been with another woman. You know what? That counts for nothing. Think of Paul in Philippians. Here I was, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, touching law blameless. And I counted all these things but loss. No, I counted them as dung that I might win Christ. Mm -hmm. Because they all yeah. get in the and way. Dung is kind of a nice word compared to the Greek. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not, yeah. I, re I remember a, a Greek student at college saying, I didn't know that Paul ever used the word, <laughs> <laughs> points of the past. Yeah, he does actually. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> it's a, not a polite term, but that's what God thinks of our righteousness. This is the thing. Well, yeah, but I come in at, at the upper level, right? I come in through the uh, the high flyers door. I mean, I, I, I'm i special. I, I don't hobnob and... You know, there's got to be first class for me someplace. No, it's mm. the same door for everybody. The same path. Everyone gets the same crown. Mm -hmm. Eternal <laughs> life is the same for it's everyone. It's kind of like with with the context of Paul thinking of Romans, what advantage then hath the Jew much in every way? It's like, yeah, you were supposed to come in through the same door as everybody else, but you also had the job of holding it for them. Yes. <laughs> and pointing toward it. And you screwed it up royally. Um yeah, that didn't that didn't those advantages, as Paul testifies in Philippians, I think it's three, uh, became disadvantages because you're tempted to trust in them. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so he's upset, and, and his servants come and say, "Look, if you'd just been asked to do some little thing, you'd have done it. Why not go do this?" And the sense of it, and the the patience and kindness of his servants win him over, and he goes. Uh, he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan. The word is not necessarily dipped. The word is he washed the way he'd been told to wash. Um, according to the saying of the man of God, his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child and was clean. Hmm. Uh, a couple things. <clears throat> First of all, Jordan itself we need to talk about. Uh are not Laban and Parfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Well, if you're talking about chemical analysis, they're probably better because, yeah, Joe Jordan at times gets really muddy. That's not the point. The point is the promise of a God and the word of a God and the commandment of God. Jordan has a long history and has a long future. When the children of Israel came to Jordan at the beginning of the conquest, they were told that every one who wants part of this inheritance, regardless of which side of Jordan it's on, has to cross Jordan. You can't stop on the right bank, the east bank, 
And having disp- disposed giants over there, just stay there and let your brethren cross over and fight their battles on the other side. If you want part of this, you have to cross Jordan. And when they come to Jordan, Jordan opens up, God separates the waters, just as he had for Israel at the Red Sea. And Paul says of that, that the children of Israel were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The conclusion we should make then is that they're baptized into Joshua in crossing the Jordan. They're put into covenant submission to Joshua, Jesus, all he represents. And so this is the only way, this is the only river. You cannot be part of God's covenant people if you do not pass here. We skipped the story, um, but when uh, it was time for Elijah to go to heaven, he crossed Jordan backwards. He came and, and it opened up for him. And he and Elisha parted or went through the parted waters. And the image there is the reverse. Wait, this is the man who has the word of God. This is God's fiery chariot of his word, of the spirit. And he's leaving. Elisha is leaving the building. Um, this should, anyone who heard this part of the story should be terrified. God is giving up on the promised land. It's like Christ telling the churches in Revelation, yeah, I'm going to take your candlestick away. Uh, it looks like it's all over, but then Elijah goes to heaven, uh, leaving his uh, mantle behind. Elisha picks it up and crosses, and he comes back to Jordan, smi- rolls up the mantle and smites the water and says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And the waters open. And he crosses back over again. And so returns and begins a spiritual reconquest of the land and the very places he starts are the very places that Joshua and Israel started on their conquest. So the image is, God was this far to deserting you. But he's back in a new, powerful, and saving way. But don't push it. If he if he came that close to leaving, he can leave you altogether. And again, it's wrapped up with Jordan. And of course, one day, John the Baptist will stand in Jordan mm-hmm. and announce the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and calls everyone to his baptism. Most of his baptisms were done in Jordan, including Jesus' own baptism, where the Father speaks from heaven and the Spirit descends. And Jesus is anointed. Um, to be our prophet, king, and priest. So that's part of what's going on here. God has purposes with Jordan, and this is one more, well, nail in the coffin doesn't quite work, but one more step in that direction of saying, this river means something, and you must submit to the meaning contained in that. You yeah. don't get, in other words, you don't get to invent your own religion. You, you do things my way. You don't need to understand why. Uh, Naaman probably did not know the whole history of Israel. He certainly couldn't foresee what God was going to do with John the Baptist and with Jesus. doesn't matter. God said, do it this way. You do it this way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. The other thing that Naaman almost certainly did not know, and that most unfortunate Christians don't know, when, when, when you hear of a leper being washed seven times, our minds should go back to Leviticus and to the laws for diagnosing and cleansing a leper. God put them there. There is no evidence that anybody, any uh, Hebrew who contracted leprosy ever was cleansed and ever went through that ceremony. The first time we hear it actually used was when Jesus, right at the beginning of his ministry, he cleanses the lepers and says, go offer the sacrifices the law requires. It's almost as if God put that there and left it silent on the pages of scripture for 1,500 years until Jesus should come and pick it up off the shelf, as it were, dust it off, and use it. Because the priests are just sitting there waiting decade after decade, century after century. They all know this, this, this cleansing ritual, and none of them gets to use it until Jesus shows up. And then there's much embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't Wait. realize until a few years ago that healing and cleansing are not interchangeable in that context. It's You, you have to be healed before these cleansing ceremonies can even be applied to you. That there it's not the laws or the things to follow in order to heal the leper. It's no. after God miraculously heals the leper, you can do no. this. <laughs> the the one thing though is that Jesus does is said to not he's never heals a leper. He always mm-hmm. cleanses a leper. And although mm-hmm. he requires the ceremonies of the law, requires that they be fulfilled, he's already done the basic work. They are mm-hmm. cleansed. But the test, the public testimony, the conformity to the requirements of the external law, he still insists on. But the the the, the cleanse for those of you who don't know the difference, um, sicknesses need to be healed, 
But some things rendered one unclean, which meant very simply, you were unfit for fellowship with God and his people in worship. So you couldn't go to synagogue, you couldn't come to the temple, you couldn't offer sacrifices, you could not participate in Passover, which effectively meant you've been excommunicated. You could not, in the case of leprosy, you could not live within the city, you had to live out of bounds, and no good Jew could come near you. If they even tried, you were to yell unclean. Now, that was most of that was irrelevant to Naaman. As, as so much of the Old Testament was seemingly irrelevant to all the Gentiles, oh, that's just a Jewish religion. It's interesting that they believe those things are weird or whatever, but it doesn't touch me. Well, it turns out, yeah, it does actually. And, and the fact that you don't understand that is part of the problem. Yeah. So Naaman comes without exactly a sense of sin, just the recognition that I've got this disease thing and it needs to go away. And he's told that it needs to be washed away. That's got to get him thinking. Well, I've taken hundreds of baths and that doesn't do anything. No, it's not that kind of cleansing. It's not that kind of washing. It's something that Jordan points to. And when he gets back, he probably spends some time with a little girl saying, now, tell me the great stories of your people. Until finally, and the Jordan parted and God's people passed through. <laughs> I mean, that's why I had to go there. Did I say something? <laughs> yes, young lady, you did. Um, but at this point, he doesn't He doesn't completely get it. The, the, the leprosy cleansing ceremony involved a number of sacrifices. So Elijah's, or Elisha has scaled it way back. But it does involve the sprinkling of water upon the leper seven times. It's a restoration of the Israelite who is uh, ceremonially dead in sins. That's what leprosy does. Uh, is a picture of, like a zombie, a living dead. He's restored to life because the waters resurrect, they bury and resurrect. And then the man is free once again to be a prophet, king, and priest. And his, he goes through much of the same uh, ritual and anointing as the priest does. Uh, the, the anointing oil on the right ear and the right thumb and the right uh, great toe because he will now hear the word of God, do the word of God, and walk in the ways of God. It's a huge, complicated ceremony. Elisha slices through most of it, but just enough to say, even Gentiles need to hear something here. They need to get this picture. And God's people, as they read the story, need to realize that this is not just some random thing God invented, but there are deep roots here that they need to be aware of. Uh, leprosy is like sin. It's a living death. It needs to be cleansed, not merely healed. And the cleansing involves something that buries and resurrects, something that comes from outside the dead man, because the dead man is dead. And the other thing the leper had to go through was he had to shave all the hair off his, head, off his body. That means a human being who has no hair in his body. Well, there's normally only one, short of cancer treatments maybe, there's only one sort of human being who has no hair. It's called a baby. And if you look at what is and said here- And they come here, through the waters, don't they? And they come through the waters. His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Not simply mm. healed, clean. He's been born again, because resurrection to life and new birth are similar images that are wrapped up in each other. So the gospel's been preached to him, however obscure the terms may be, he, he gets at least this. There's a God in heaven who associates himself with Israel, whose word can do what no other gods can do, no other magician. It's a sovereign word. It's a powerful word. Uh, it, it registers in time and space, this local place where I'm required to do something that I don't want to do, and yet it's something that anyone could do. And I am, as it were, a new man because of the power of this God. And he was kind to me when I have been cruel to his people. That's a God I want to know about. That's a God I want to follow. That's a God I want to be thankful to. So he comes back, bringing his entourage, and <clears throat> comes to the prophet. And this time, uh, well, I'll read it, 15. He returned to the man of God. So this time Elijah, Elisha comes out, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. He understands that Yahweh is not only the greatest God, he's the only God. Uh, th there is no other God who can do this, and therefore there is no other God. Uh, you, can't, if you, you can't halfway do something like this. <laughs> God who can do this is absolutely sovereign. His word is sovereign. 
And he doesn't care a whit about what I think or feel. Wow. And yet he was kind to me. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Now, this was not necessarily a wrong thing. If it is sheer thankfulness, I, God did something great for me, I want to express my thankfulness, that's fine. But Elisha realizes that given his pagan background, this could be misunderstood, that he could misunderstand this, and he needs desperately not to misunderstand right now. Could seem like he's paying for it. God gave me this, now I will pay my bill. So lest Naaman get that, Elisha says, nope. And certainly he wants to make it very clear that he himself is not in this for the money. You don't pay the preacher to get God's blessing. That's not, that's not how it works. As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. Notice his, his uh, claim. I am a messenger of God. I am a lawyer of the covenant. I stand in the very presence of God. Yes, I'm that close to him. And in his name, I tell you, I, we will take nothing of you. You can't pay for this. <laughs> Consider this over again, Simon the Sorcerer. It's just mm. going to make that comparison. Well, go ahead and make it for people who may not know Simon. Oh, Simon, I forget exactly which city he was in, but... Uh, Samaria. Samaria, that's right. Uh, he was a warlock, for lack of a better term. And he... Uh, when when the gospel came, he apparently was convinced he was baptized with new believers, and at least by by word, laid his allegiance with um, with Jesus. And when the apostles then later came and showed their works of power in the Spirit, he approached them and said, "I've got to have this. Like, how much?" <laughs> How much can I pay you for this new magic trick? Because it'll mean, you know, maybe something along the lines of I'll be the top dog in town again, like I used to be, yeah, where I had yeah. so much money. And um, is it Peter who yeah. confronts him? Peter's yeah. like, no. And also, <laughs> you have the devil in you, you monstrous man. You cannot pay for this kind of thing. It is entirely a gift of grace. And um, I mean, if the writings of the church fathers or anything to go by. Simon became a thorn in the side of the early church for many, many years after that. Yeah. Peter's words were, your money perish with you, Simon. Mm -hmm. That's Harsh. pretty fair. Yeah. <laughs> you and your money could both go to hell is what he says. Mm -hmm. uh, and he does not say so lightly. That is not taking the Lord's name in vain. That is a divine pronouncement because... The apostles rank even higher in God's kingdom in terms of what they were, what they knew, and what they could do than the prophets did. Uh, Peter sees clearly, you're, but you're trying to corrupt the gospel and replace it with one of salvation by works. And Elijah, Elisha, to some extent, understood that, and therefore he refuses absolutely the gift. Naaman then says, "Shall there not that I pray thee be given to thy servant two mules' burden of earth, for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods." but unto the Lord. Now, this might be a little superstitious, or it might be a purely symbolic thing on his part, and Elisha does not inquire after this. He is a new believer, a weak believer, an uninstructed believer. Somehow he, somebody wrote the first several verses of this chapter, so someone had talked to the little girl, or talked to someone who knew the little girl. Maybe it was Elisha, maybe word got back later, um, as I've said before, it's, yes, God could have just popped the knowledge into Elisha's mind, but more often than not, uh, these the, the accounts come to us as first word or first person testimony, eyewitness testimony, and and so he would, Elisha would know somebody sent you here, somebody can instruct you. Yes, it may be a seven year old girl, but that's worked pretty good so far. <laughs> so there'll be time for you to grow. You want to offer your sacrifices on Israeli soil because you understand that covenantally the land is significant. Fine. That's, I'm not going to say anything about that because your goal is to worship only the one true God. And you want to recognize that his covenant promises have historical touch points. This time, this land, this water, this place. Uh, you renounce, in, in a word, you're renouncing Gnosticism for a God who works and operates in history. So, mm -hmm. you know, not going to complain about that. It could, could your faith be more mature? Yeah, but so could everybody's. <laughs> um, in this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. 
that when my master goeth into the house of Remen to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Remen, when I bow down myself in the house of Remen, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. So he's the king's right-hand man, literally. And when the king goes to worship, the king has to bow before the image of Remen. And in order to facilitate this, Naaman on his right hand has to bow down with him to, in the sense of going down on his knees to help his king bow. And he realizes that this is not, it bowing down to an idol is wrong. Will God understand that I'm not bowing down to the idol? <laughs> I am simply helping my king do what, doing something that's wrong, yes, but it's my job to help him here. He's going to do it one way or the other. Uh, will God forgive me and now not count it as idolatry when I do what my job requires? And, and again, we could be very picky and say, well, you're helping somebody else commit idolatry. That's completely unacceptable. Mm. We could go, it doesn't... Well, it doesn't matter what you're thinking. What matters is your position of your body. He's not bowing with reference to the idol. He's bowing with reference to... Yeah, but there we go again. Kings shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't help another man commit idolatry. Interesting enough, Elisha simply says, go in peace. Now, I've heard people say, um, Elisha just doesn't want to push the point and, and is willing to... All right, you want to go commit idolatry, that's your business. That's not the meaning of go in peace. Shalom. <laughs> no. It, it means and God. And the prophet of the Lord wouldn't use no. <laughs> it in that way anyway. <laughs> no, no. He's he's saying you, what you you've asked that God pardon this thing. Go in His peace. Then, uh, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Uh, Elijah accepts that this man has been that his faith is sufficient at that point in the time in history, under these circumstances, to be reckoned as true justifying faith. He doesn't understand much. He understands there is one God who saves people who does not deserve it, and that this man, this Naaman, is throwing himself wholly on this God and wants to be thankful and wants to obey him, knowing that his obedience will be imperfect. Will God accept such from a Gentile? And Elisha's word is shalom, peace, wholeness, health, salvation. Well, you would think the story would end there, and it would be glorious. <laughs> Can I jump in there? Yeah, Can sure. You go on? Uh, it reminds me of a conversation my church had in Sunday school recently about the command to worship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's so easy to have the question be, well, what can or can't we do on Sundays? Mm -hmm. Or what's different about Sunday? You mm -hmm. know, what, what is there something spiritual about Sunday as opposed to Saturday or Monday or Thursday? And the answer is that's the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> Once we start focusing on the means as though there's something special in them, we've missed the point. You know, it wasn't that yeah. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a special tree, except that God had said it was. Yeah. That it was God's word that set this thing apart. Yeah. It wasn't special, except that God had ordained it. Um, and so when we yeah. separate the means of God from the words of God, that's when we we fall into the magic, yeah. the magical mindset. Yes, what, what is the the line from our Lord? Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for the man. Right. You you, you don't prioritize the very good blessing of a day of rest as something magical in itself. Mm -hmm. It's it's the rest in the Lord in remembering what he has done for you, in his graciousness of gifting that to you. Right. So in and the same way that the, the water of the Jordan was just water and kind of muddy water at that, but yeah. it was the river that God had specified. Yeah. And this is the, the, the gift of God and the, the worship of God is what God defines it to be. It's not because your bowing was special or your washing was special. It's that it was according to the word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens next is Naaman and his entourage begin to... So having said entourage once, I want to keep using the word because it's a cool word, I think. <laughs> he and his entourage um, are leaving, and Gehazi, the, the servant, the, the minister, the, the man who probably was in line to be the next prophet if, if he proved to mature in the faith properly, uh, sees this. And says, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman the Syrian, and not receiving at his hands that which he brought. 
But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. As the Lord, he just swore in God's name that he's <laughs> going to go commit sacrilege by taking from this man something that Elisha has refused. Gehazi has no claims on this. But he oh probably, there's some kind of rationalization going on here, and we're good at this sort of thing. Um, well, this man is the enemy. He brought the wealth to give it to us. Elisha may not want it, but I have good uses for it. And certainly anything I do with it is going to be better than anything he would do with it because he's a wicked Gentile. So uh, we should at least spoil him a little bit, and I'm sure I'll find some useful thing here. So he runs after him in the name of the Lord. And, and Naaman sees him coming and, and stops the chariots and goes down to meet him. Says, is all well? He says, all's well. Literally, it's interesting. The King James says, is all well. The Hebrew is shalom. <laughs> That's Did the word. Did he go in peace? <laughs> yes. Are you, are you coming in the peace that your master just pronounced on me or something else? Has something gone wrong here? Said so in Gehazi, says, shalom, all is well. My master has sent me saying, behold, even now there come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets, two seminary students. Give them, I pray, the talent of silver and two changes of garment. Well, this sounds like a nice spiritual explanation for why he would now ask for something that he previously declined. And Naaman is very anxious to, to give thanks to God, some kind of thank offering. And so, without sensing the duplicity, which in such a man is a little strange, but he is dealing quest culturally here, and probably through a translator. Behold, um, these these two men. Can you do? The, Naaman said, "Be content. Take two talents. I'll go even above that." He probably could have given a lot more, but he also probably realizes, "Well, if I I can't, if I do it, give too much, the prophet's going to be upset." But I'm sure he won't mind if I throw just a little more, because then one talent for each, one change of garment for each. That seems fair and everything. I'm sure God will be pleased with this. Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon uh, two of his servants and they bare them before him. Two changes of garments. That doesn't mean much to us now, but in the ancient world, that was huge. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a second wardrobe. It was not unusual in, in the ancient world up through the Middle Ages for someone to have one change of clothing and you went down to the river or creek and washed them and immediately put them back on because you didn't have anything else. Or maybe you had just you know a couple bits of scraps here and there to have a, a second change of clothing. And this would I mean, have clothing been- Clothing is so incredibly labor intensive to obtain in the ancient world. Yes. Yep. And this would have been that design for royalty, or at least for military, high rank. So this, this, these were princely gifts, uh, as was the silver. And notice he doesn't give gold, nor does does anyone ask for gold. They're, 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 by keeping it at the lever, level of silver, it's it's not enough of a request to raise eyebrows. It's it's, but a talent of silver was a lot of money. It's a talent, of course, is a weight of silver, and I can never remember how it weighs out. But even in our money, it would have been a lot. And so these guys carry it back. This is when he came to the tower. He took them from his hand and bestowed them in the house and let them in go, and they departed. And he went and stood before his master. So he checks in, as no doubt was it his responsibility. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? You know, this is mom and dad looking at little kids. What have you been doing? Nothing. <laughs> uh huh. Um. Thy servant went no whither. Ooh, blatant lie. He said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? This is one time when God did show him in vision exactly what was going on. It's at a time, and this is, this is the response at first seems huge and over, overly done, but we need to consider what's at the root. Is it time to receive money and to receive garments? And olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants. I'm sure, Gehazi is nervous on the first two, but then he got wait, wait. I didn't ask for that, or that, or that. You know, oh, I didn't realize I could ask for that one. But whatever the case, he <laughs> he 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 can legitimately say, I didn't ask for all. I I just yes, the first two you got me. Yes, I did. It just, I mean, it just didn't seem right that he should get away with all this stuff when God was so gracious to him. Obviously, it should come to me. 
<laughs> well, people that take advantage it. of you if you give stuff away for free, Elisha. Yeah, yeah. So, but what is this about Elisha escalating? Well, because he sees he sees the ocean and the drop of water. Um, will you do this if I give you the world? No, not for the world. How about if you know for Las Vegas? Eh, no. No, no, no. How about Las Bandas? Hmm. How about your neighbor's <laughs> swimming pool? Okay, you got me there. Yeah, it doesn't matter <laughs> how big the thing is for which you will sell out the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. uh, you do it for just um, a chance to sit down out of the sun for a few moments, or you do it so that you can have receive all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. It's it, There's no difference. Mm -hmm. there, there's an old... This may not be very polite, but I'm going to use it anyway. There's an old joke where a man is hitting on a young lady and ask if uh, he she will um, yield to him for um, for hundred thousand dollars. She says, "Oh, of course." She says, "How about for twenty five dollars?" Oh, what kind of girl do you think I am? Well, we've already established that. Now we're just haggling <laughs> about the price, aren't we? <laughs> and you know, it's something like that. We well, if you. If somebody offers a million dollars, well, that's significant, but this is nothing. That's the point. You'll sell mm -hmm. the kingdom of God for nothing. If you'll sell the kingdom of God for nothing, you would sell it for a million dollars. It's a question of how big is your greed? How much do you think you can get away with? How much can wash over your conscience and you still feel you can do this thing? And so he pushes all the way to, it doesn't, in this thing, you've, you've opened the door for everything. You people will sell the kingdom for whatever they can get out of it. They'll sell the gospel, make merchandise of the truth. And mm. so, what you have done, even it, it, as small as it is, and that's the problem, it's as small as it is. And for this, you would betray the gospel. Mm. And the last verse is the leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper, as white as snow. And so, nay, uh, Gehazi will not be the next prophet. He will not minister to Israel. He will be a leper for the rest of his life. And apparently, if he has any children, they will be lepers. The judgment is very hard and very harsh because what it's, what's at stake here is the gospel. Is there another way? Is there another stream? Is there another fountain? Is there some other name under heaven whereby we may be saved? Is the gate actually pretty wide after all? Or at least are there alternate gates if I don't like this one? Mm. And in our generation, that's this is a huge issue. Um, people are willing to, even Christians are willing to say, well, yes, I came to Christ, but not everyone has to come my way, do they? Um, yeah. Uh, about that, yes. <laughs> uh, you, you both, I'm sure, remember um, the seventh chronicle of Narnia, the one that never happened. <laughs> um, where I'm not at, familiar with that, actually. What? <laughs> where at the end... I wish he'd written a seventh book in that series. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wish she after how good the sixth one In was. that series, yes. Um, the, uh, the, the young pagan shows up in heaven and feels out of place because he's never worshipped Aslan. He's always served the god Tash. But Aslan appears and says, no, no, you misunderstood. The kind of worship you gave was not the kind that one gives to a demon. It was the kind that should be given to me. It was full of love and good works and service. And so, therefore, although you rendered it, you thought to this name, it was. Re I took it as to myself, and therefore, you're entitled to heaven. I'm sorry, Jack. What were you thinking when you wrote that? <laughs> I still what? have no idea. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do not understand. And I, uh, once upon a time in, um, what is I even writing? I was right. I, I, I was writing something. I can't even remember which article it was. Now I think it was for Chalcedon. Um, where um, I, I, I did that line. There are some series that have episodes or books that never really happened, and I mentioned that, and among other things. And I got whatever I was writing about. I got I got a sweet letter from a nice lady who said, "Oh, I really liked your your, your article, except this one thing. Isn't it in referencing Lewis in, in um, um, the Last Battle?" Isn't it, isn't it possible that there are other ways to come to, to God than through Jesus? Because think of all the people who've never heard of Jesus. And I'm thinking, what in the world are you thinking? You say that you, you read Christian materials, you're familiar with Christian ideas, 
And you think there's some other way? You, a small child raised in a broad evangelical church who's given its heart to Jesus knows there's no other way. There's no substitute. There's nothing you add on. There's nothing you can alter. You can't rewrite Jesus to fit your social agenda. He, he is the God, the Savior the Bible describes. This is why John, at the end of his first epistle, after arguing for who Jesus must be, says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Yeah. To redesign Jesus is to make an idol out of your Jesus. Well, my Jesus would never. Well, your Jesus ain't the real one, obviously, because our Jesus did exactly what the Bible says he did. And that is offensive to people. What when, um, There was back in the late 70s, 80s, I forget, there was a movie called Oh God, starring um, George Burns. Mm -hmm. I do not recommend it to anybody. Just from the uh, title, I can imagine why. Yeah, and, and the idea is that God wants to reassert himself in the modern world, and he wants people just to start thinking about God. And the young protagonist, who he fastens on to be sort of his prophet, at least I don't think he's ever called that, was, I think he was played by John Denver, of all people. Um, <laughs> what? At one, at one point, it's just curious, and he asks George, he asks George Burns, the question that is inevitable, someone had to ask it, and so he does. So is Jesus your son? And this man who claims to be God says, yes, Jesus was my son. And Muhammad was my son. And Buddha, Confucius, they were all my sons. I have many sons. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the way of the world. We will allow Jesus to be a savior among many, as long as he's not the one we have to pick. You want Jesus as your savior, that's your business, but don't tell him, don't tell me he has to be my savior, not the way you describe him. Because like Naaman, he leaves no place for my goodness, for my will, my choices, my ceremonies, my personal goodness, my loving heart. He nixes all of that and hangs it all on his own merits. I don't want that savior. You want that, that's your business. But you want to alter him a little, make him a different kind of Jesus, maybe we can work with that. And so there's a strong gospel presentation here, right in, right in the middle of Second Kings. So there is only one way. Yeah, uh, I, I think back uh, to a, a family that I became acquainted with and friends with uh, when I was at Sierra College uh, for community college. Uh, they were raised Mormon, and at some point in the past, their their parents had left the church and they were still very close friends with all the people from their you know local temples or whatever uh but i remember talking with them at one point about faith and about you know the, the orthodox christian doctrine and they were still very much stuck in the you know the the common lds i guess framework is you know you are saved by grace after all you can do, mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to do everything you can first. And I was explaining, just I think I think one of them specifically asked about um, Christology, like who mm -hmm. Jesus is. And I was like, well, you know, he's he's the God Man. He is the eternal Son of God, come in human flesh. He's pure man and pure God, fully man, fully God. And this was necessary for our salvation. And you know, sort of the um, Anselm, why the God Man argument, mm -hmm. basically in a in a nutshell. And I remember she she sat because I was talking to just one of the one of the the daughters at one point at that point, and she was like, "I don't know if I like that because why should why should it all come down to what someone else did?" <laughs> exactly. I was like, "That's kind of the point." <laughs> I remember hearing of a seminary professor, you know, some a student is saying, well, what, what do we say when people ask, you know, what about the people who have never heard of Jesus? What about these people who are sincere but believe differently? Can you blame people who have never heard the gospel for not believing it? And the professor says, yes, they can be blamed <laughs> for for not trusting in Jesus. That's why you have a job to do, to go tell them about Jesus so that they can trust in him. There's this desire to excuse other people because it really takes the heat off us yes. and our responsibility to tell them. 
Um, it's so much easier to say, well, the Lord will excuse them when we're what's really behind that is the Lord will excuse me from making disciples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have, I have five brethren and if send Lazarus back and they'll believe if one speaks to him, who's come back from the dead, let they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. No, but if one rises from the dead, no, if they will not hear That's Moses not and the prophets, they will not believe the one rises from the dead. And of course, in that scenario, the man in hell doesn't care a thing about his brethren. He's in hell. <laughs> you know, he, there's no love in him, but he was trying to find wiggle room. If I can get them to admit that my brethren haven't had enough evidence, then it works for me too. Mm. And so if I, yeah, the, the heathen, God will surely let them in. Anybody who's sincere, anybody who's good, anybody who's nice. That means Isn't, my sincerity, my goodness, my niceness yeah, are enough. Because yeah, because mine's obviously better than theirs. Yeah, it's the the attempt to insert our own good works, our filthy rag, our filthy rags of self righteousness. Yep. Uh, where only the blood of Jesus counts, and that's what makes people very angry. Paul, in, in writing, um, I believe this is to the Galatians, says. If if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? For then is the offense of the cross ceased. Yep. <laughs> if I could tell them, hey, there's you absolutely have to trust in Jesus and do this one thing, no one would persecute me. I give them one thing that they have to do, then I'm good. I'm golden. They'll they'll buy me tickets. They'll feast me. They'll they'll give me all kinds of stuff. The moment yep. I say there is nothing you can do, that's when people get mad. That's when people get mad. That's when they want to kill you. That's why Cain killed Abel, and why the mm -hmm. Jews killed the prophets, and why they killed Jesus. Because yeah. there's only one way, and that is the most unpopular message in the history of the world, even though it amounts to the simplest thing. So what must I do to be saved? Believe. That's too easy. Can't do impossible, unless God opens your heart. I don't get any credit for that. Yeah. No, no, no credit. No, I want no. credit for what I've done. Yeah, I want to be recognized. I want the mm. accolades. Are I want bonus Jesus points to pat involved? me on the head and say, you did really good, better than those other people. Yeah, you're better than those people. So, all right, well, you know, this is the kind of message that shouldn't offend any of our listeners, but it'll be interesting to see if it does. I hope it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. But if it does, it would be the kind of people who need it. Yeah, I hope it's more comforting yeah. because there's there's comfort for us. Yeah. And, and, and those of you who are listening, this would be a great one to share with some of your uh, unbelieving friends, whether they go to church or not. Yeah. And then they can hate us, and then they can hate you secondly. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can talk to you about how much they hate us, and then yeah. you can There's your opportunity. have that go conversation. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Hmm. All right. We well, We aim to be of service. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent service, uh, guaranteed. Uh, well, with that, I think it's time to move on to recommendations. Do either of you have things you'd like to recommend? Uh, sure, but you should go first, Brian. Uh, you know what? I am going to recommend having ducks. Yay! <laughs> Quack. Okay. Quack. Every time... Okay, so funny story is every time my wife shares something about what the ducks have done... We've only had them since Wednesday, but like mm -hmm. she's been super excited about it. I have been too, admittedly. But every time she mentions anything to do with the ducks, she goes, I, I, I always respond to quack. Like wherever we're talking, it's like <laughs> in person, in a messenger group chat, doesn't matter. I just go quack. Um, I type it out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we got we got two two ducks. They're currently uh, relaxing about six feet to my left in a rubber container. I will show you them when we're done recording. Mm. And um, they are, so these are. These are little ducks. Little, they are ducklings. They oh, they both oh, can how fit cute. this big, both of them Aww. together. Um, and uh, they are Indian runners, which means that when they grow up, they will be awkwardly gangly and tall. And then they will <laughs> just kind of lean forward at a, at a 30 degree angle and bolt. Like they just run that. that it, they look so weird. They're so cute. <laughs> so can they fly or do you have to clip their wings or something? Oh, they are flightless. They're bred to be that way. Oh, okay. Thankfully, <sighs> yeah. But they'll they'll provide lots of eggs. Hmm. Duck eggs. Yeah. Nice. All right, Emily. I recommend wagons. I think wagons are great. Wagons, um, awesome. 
yeah, we, um, when we started putting together a gift registry for Gretchen, because apparently when you're having a baby, people want to give you gifts. So you have to tell them what you want. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, goodness, what do I want? I don't know. Um, but, you know, one of the questions you have to answer is, well, do you want like a car seat that clips into a stroller because that's fancy and convenient? Or do you want this stroller or that stroller? And I was like, I don't want a stroller. I want a wagon. <laughs> so we found a wagon and it's super great. You can carry your baby in it. You can carry your laundry in it. You can carry your groceries in it. And a wagon. We, we got a, the church ladies were kind enough to band together to purchase this wagon for us. And it's, an all-terrain wagon so i can take it to the park and drive it over the lawn and (laughs) gretchen loves it and it's super fun so wagons wagons are great and it's so much better than the hand truck that i used to use to carry the laundry Mm. so nice wagons i still have my wagon from my childhood and we really? never put That's our so cool. yeah our children played in it when they were little. Now that they're not, it becomes the hauling device for outside for all kinds of garden work, soil, dead plants, whatever. Uh, we now have a wheelbarrow too, but for a long time that was it. That's all we had. And the nice thing is that it does have the the handle that when you pull it back, it becomes a steering wheel. I mean, not with mm. minus the wheel, but so <laughs> someone can get behind you and push you, and you can use the the handle to steer. Mm-hmm. And it becomes um, a little car for you. So, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Wag- wagons are good things. I am going to recommend summer. Yay! <laughs> because, <laughs> one, God made it, and therefore it is beyond question a worthy and blessed thing. Mm-hmm. More so for some of us than for others, for those of us who are teachers. You know, there, there are... Two different mindsets, I think, for people, for non-teachers who look at, at teachers in summer. And some say, wow, you don't have to work at all for those three or four months or whatever. <laughs> okay, you're out of yeah, touch no. with reality. What do you want? Because mm-hmm. that's when we have to do a lot of prep. First of all, we have to do a lot of catch up for the previous year as we get report cards done and clean up our rooms and all that stuff we should do. Uh, and then at some point, we have to start getting for the next year because hopefully, one hopes, I should say, that we want to do a better a better job next time around. And so mm-hmm. we want to refine our notes, come up with new ideas, talk to people about what they've done, um, find new books, read new books, mm-hmm. uh, outline new books, and, and in general, work at becoming better for next year, getting as much as we can in uh, all set so that it doesn't take as much out of us during the school year. Yeah. And yeah, there are some people who think you never stop working. Yeah, we actually do a little here and there. We do have a little time for our families and for gardening and such like that. And you know, there was there was a time when I was growing up when even for families who, you know, mom and dad kept working during the summer, but you know, there was something magic about summer. Kids got to go out and play and swim and. Uh, I don't know how it was in your generation. My generation, so I am told, my parents are far too protective. Uh, my generation, <laughs> kids were just kicked out at the beginning of the day, maybe given an apple or something to carry with them or candy bar. And then they did, they weren't seen again until supper time. They were just, they were, their mom didn't have to worry about them because no one was going to snatch them. No one was going to abuse them. No one was yep. going to hurt them. And, you know, what's the worst that could happen? They fall out of a tree and break an arm. Big deal. Take them to the doctor. <laughs> um and uh, everybody in the neighborhood knew everybody. One of my uh, quintessential memories that defines that era of my life, and indeed that era in small town of America, one summer evening, the sun was still up in the sky, but it was cool. Uh, my cousin who lived down the street, somehow uh, the neighbor girl who was younger than me brought over her wiffle ball and wiffle bat. Hey. And my cousin who was a few years older than me, so he was probably in his 20s or so, um, got out there and started playing wiffle ball with us. No big deal. But but it was summer. So kids were just moving up and down the street, moseying from point A to point B with no purpose in mind. And first some kids saw us and say, hey, that looks like fun. Can I join? And the next kid comes along, hey, that looks like fun. Can I join? And pretty soon, a ton of kids from all over, some of whom I didn't even know, were all in our in my cousin's front yard playing wiffle ball <laughs> as the sun goes down. And 
it was just one of those sweet memories of this is what small town America used to be like, but only in the <laughs> summer when you didn't have anything to do and you yeah. could be anywhere and everybody knew everywhere. That's a little, you know, Zechariah speaks of the kingdom of God as a time when there'll be boys and girls playing in the streets of Jerusalem and old yeah. men and old women hobbling along on their staves for very age. Summer can and used to be in America, kind of a little picture of that. And I'm, I'm sorry to see so much of it go, but I think it behooves us to, to try to find some of that peacefulness and usefulness of free time and not be completely overwhelmed by all the demands of modern life. So my recommendation is rediscover the possibilities of summer. Yeah. I, that reminds it's, me of the movie The Sandlot that always hmm, makes me yes. think of the way my dad talked about growing up. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it's, I think it's a good thing. It's, you know, it's not something that I have particular memories of in quite the same way. Um, and I, I know my husband certainly doesn't have that kind of childhood summer memory quite the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. But to see a glimpse of that and to see, ah, there is an ideal, mm -hmm. you know, not a perfect one, but a... Uh, a fun one, certainly, with a great yeah. soundtrack. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's also funny you say that it's it's missing so much because I was looking out my window just now and there are about seven kids playing basketball on my mm. street here. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool there's style. a book that I haven't read um, that I want to recommend. I do recommend books that I haven't read, but I always tell you that I haven't read them. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Playborhood. There was an interview on Art of Manliness about intentionally going about trying to form the kind of neighborhood where kids can go out and play. And that's a normal thing I love and that. that's expected. Mm, yeah. um, and the the intentionality that it takes in these days to cultivate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Um, to our listeners, thank you as well. Uh, if you'd like to follow us, if you are not already, you can do so at our YouTube channel, uh, on Rumble. You can like our Facebook page. And if you like the show and want to subscribe, you can subscribe. We're on pretty much all the podcast catchers, all the RSS feeds. So uh, if you can't find us, let us know. If you would like to re uh, reach out to us with questions or to give suggestions for episode topics or anything really uh our email is halting towards zion at gmail.com a very very big thank you to our financial supporters who help make the show possible if you'd like to join our financial supporters uh you can support us at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards zion and a thank you to david maxson our producer who gets these episodes edited and out to the listeners we hope you join us next time and we'll see you then